That's our devotional reading for today, November 1, 2023. We will read from the book Reflecting Christ, How Men and Women Have Reflected Christ, November 1st, God's Children to be Light Bearers. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5 verse 16 God never designed that one man's mind or judgment should be a controlling power. Whenever he has had a special work to be done, he has always had men ready to meet that demand. In every age when the divine voice has asked, Who will go for us? The response has come, Here am I, send me. In ancient times, the Lord had connected with His work men of varied talents, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses with his meekness and wisdom, and Joshua with his varied capabilities were all enlisted in God's service. The music of Miriam, the courage and piety of Deborah, the filial affection of Ruth, the obedience and faithfulness of Samuel, all were needed. Elijah, with his stern traits of character, God used at his appointed time to execute judgment upon Jezebel. God will not give his spirit to those who make no use of the heavenly gift, but those who are drawn out of away from themselves, seeking to enlighten, encourage, and bless others, will have increased ability and energy to expand. The more light they give, the more they receive. From the Southern Watchman, October 31, 1905. Also from the Review and Herald, May 29, 1900. In all ages, the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, 1 Peter 1, verse 11, has made God's true children the light of the people of their generation. Joseph was a light-bearer in Egypt. In his purity and benevolence and filial love, he re represented Christ in the midst of a nation of idolaters. While the Israelites were on their way from Egypt to the Promised Land, the true-hearted among them were a light to the surrounding nations. Through them, God was revealed to the world. From Daniel and his companions in Babylon and from Mordecai in Pers Persia, bright beams of light shone out amid the darkness of the kingly courts. In like manner, the disciples of Christ are set as light bearers on the way to heaven. Through them, the Father's mercy and goodness are made manifest to a world enshrouded in the darkness of misapprehension of God. By seeing their good works, others are led to glorify the Father who is above, for it is made manifest that there is a God on the throne of the universe whose character is worthy of praise and imitation. The divine love glowing in the heart, the Christ-like harmony manifested in the life, are as a glimpse of heaven granted to men of the world that they may appreciate its excellence. It is thus that men are led to believe the love that God hath to us. 1 John 4 verse 16 Thus hearts once sinful and corrupt are purified and transformed to be presented faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Jude verse 24 also from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page, pages 41 and 42. We will also read from the book In Heavenly Places, Our Mission to the World, November 1st. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. John 17, verse 18. Will separation from the world in obedience to the divine command and fit us for the work the Lord has left us? Will it hinder us from doing good to those around us? No, the firmer hold we have on heaven, the greater will be our power of usefulness. We should study the pattern that the Spirit which dwelt in Christ may dwell in us. The Savior was not found among the exalted and honorable of the world. He did not spend his time among those who are seeking their ease and pleasure. He worked to help those who needed help, to save the lost and perishing, to lift up the bow down, to break the yoke of oppression from those in bondage, 
to heal the afflicted and to speak words of sympathy and consolation to the distressed and sorrowing. We are required to follow this example. The more we partake of the Spirit of Christ, the more we shall seek to do for our fellow men. We shall bless the needy and comfort the distressed. Probation is about to close. Soon the last prayer for sinners will have been offered, the last tear shed, the last warning given, the last entreaty made, and the sweet voice of mercy will be heard no more. This is why Satan is making such mighty efforts to secure men and women in his snare. The enemy is playing the game of life for every soul. He is working to remove from us everything of a spiritual nature and in the place of the precious graces of Christ to crowd our hearts with the evil traits of the carnal nature, hatred, evil, surmising, jealousy, love of the world, love of self, love of pleasure, and the pride of life. We need to be fortified against the incoming foe, for unless we are watchful and prayerful, these evils will enter the heart and crowd out all that is good. How great is the responsibility placed upon the disciple of Christ! How imperative the duty to reflect the light of heaven upon a world enshrouded in darkness! The deeper the surrounding gloom, the brighter should shine out the light of Christian faith and Christian example. Let's also read from the book Lift Him Up. Lift him up as our advocate and infallible judge, Jesus, our advocate, November 1st. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, 1 John 2, verse 1. Jesus is our advocate, our high priest, our intercessor. Our position is like that of the Israelites on the Day of Atonement. When the high priest entered the most holy place, representing the place where our high priest is now pleading, and sprinkled the atoning blood upon the mercy seat, no propitiatory sacrifices were offered without. While the priest was interceding with God, every heart was to be bowed in contrition, pleading for the pardon of transgression. Type met antitype in the death of Christ, the lamb slain for the sins of the world. Our great high priest has made the only sacrifice that is of any value in our salvation. When he offered himself on the cross, a perfect atonement was made for the sins of the people. We are now standing in the outer court, waiting and looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No sacrifices are to be offered without, for the great high priest is performing his work in the most holy place. In his intercession as our advocate, Christ needs no man's virtue, no man's intercession. He is the only sin-bearer, the only sin-offering. Prayer and confession are to be offered only to him who has entered once for all into the most holy place. He will save to the uttermost all who come to him in faith. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. The mightiest created intellect cannot comprehend God. Words from the most eloquent tongue fail to describe Him. Men have only one advocate, one intercessor, who is able to pardon transgression. Shall not our hearts swell with gratitude to Him who gave Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins? Think deeply upon the love that the Father has manifested in our behalf, the love that He has expressed for us. We cannot measure this love, for measurement there is none. Can we measure infinity? We can only point to Calvary, to the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. No middleman comes between the sinner and Christ. Christ himself is our advocate. All that the Father is to his Son, he is to those whom his Son in humanity represented. In every line of his work, Christ acted as a representative of the Father. He lived as our substitute and surety. He labored as he would have his followers labor, unselfishly appreciating the value of every human being for whom he suffered and died. Taken from the Signs of the Times, June 28, 1899. Let's also read from the book, Our High Calling, 
Have you counted the cost? November 1st. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, verse 33. The world's Redeemer presents to his followers the plan of the battle in which they are called to engage, and he bids them count the cost. He assures them that angels who excel in strength shall be in his army and will enable those who trust in him to fight valiantly. One shall chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, not through their own strength, but through the power of omnipotence. The captain of the Lord's host is with them, taking the command of the armies and leading them on to victory. Because of their human frailty, because of their sinfulness, they may fear and tremble as they view the vast host, of the powers of darkness, but they may rejoice as they look upon the angels of God ready to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. They may rejoice as they realize that the captain of the Lord's host will lead them forward in every conflict against natural and supernatural foes. Your leader is a conqueror. Advance to victory. How precious are these assurances that we shall never be left to take one step in our own finite strength, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13 verse 5 We are fighting in the presence of invisible hosts. Unseen intelligences survey the whole array of evil, and help is at hand. We shall not only be provided with that which is necessary, but shall be placed upon vantage ground. To every Christian comes the word that was addressed to Peter. Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Luke 22, verse 31. Thank God we are not left alone. This is our safety. Satan can never touch with eternal disaster. One whom Christ has prepared for temptation by his previous intercession. For grace is provided in Christ for every soul, and a way of escape has been made, so that no one need fall under the power of the enemy. Let's also read from the book, This Day with God. Know Yourself, November 1st. Among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of man more than the praise of God. John 12, verses 42 and 43. There is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This message, understood in its true character and proclaimed in the Spirit, will lighten the earth with its glory. The great decisive question is to be brought before all nations, tongues, and peoples. The closing work of the third angel's message will be attended with a power that will send the rays of the Son of Righteousness into all the highways and byways of life, and decisions will be made for God as Supreme Governor. His law will be looked upon as the rule of His government. Many who claim to believe the truth will change their opinions in times of peril and will take the side of the transgressors of God's law in order to escape persecution. There will be great humbling of heart before God on the part of everyone who remains faithful and true to the end. But Satan will so work upon the unconsecrated elements of the human mind that many will not accept the light in God's appointed way. There is positive danger that some who profess to believe the truth will be found in a position similar to that of the Jews. They take the ideas of the man they are associated with, not because by searching the scriptures they cons cons conscientiously, cons conscientiously sorry, accept the teachings and doctrine as truth. I entreat you to make God your trust, idolize no man, depend upon no man, let not your love of man hold them in places of trust that they are not qualified to fill to the glory of God, for man is finite and erring, liable to be controlled by his own opinions and feelings. Self-esteem and self-righteousness are coming in upon us, and many will fall because of unbelief and unrighteousness, for the grace of Christ is not ruling in the hearts of many. 
we are to be ever searching for the truth as for hidden treasures. I have been shown that Jesus will reveal to us precious old truths in a new light if we are ready to receive them, but they must be received in the very way in which the Lord shall choose to send them. Taken from Manuscript 15, November 1, 1888, A Call to a Deeper Study of the Word. We will also read from the book, Our Father Cares. Christ's compassion knew no limit, November 1st. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases, Matthew 8, verse 17. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world as the unwearied servant of man's necessity. He took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses that he might minister to every need of humanity. The burden of disease and wretchedness and sin he came to remove. It was his mission to bring to man complete restoration. He came to give them health and peace and perfection of character. Varied were the circumstances and needs of those who besought his aid and none who came to him went away unhelped. From him flowed a stream of healing power and in body and mind and soul men were made whole. The Savior's work was not restricted to any time or place. His compassion knew no limit. On so large a scale did he conduct his work of healing and teaching that there was no building in Palestine large enough to receive the multitudes that thronged to him. On the green hill slopes of Galilee and the thoroughfares of travel, by the seashore and the synagogues, and in every place where the sick could be brought to him was to be found his hospital. In every city, every town, every village through which he passed, he laid his hands upon the afflicted ones and healed them. Wherever there were hearts ready to receive his message, he comforted, he comforted them with the assurance of their Heavenly Father's love. All day he ministered to those who came to him. In the evening he gave attention to such as through the day must toil to earn a pittance for the support of their families. Jesus carried the awful weight of responsibility for the salvation of men. He knew that unless there was a decided change in the principles and purposes of the human race, all would be lost. This was the burden of his soul, and none could appreciate the weight that rested upon him. Through childhood, youth, and manhood, he walked alone. Day by day he met trials and temptations. Day by day he was brought into contact with evil and witnessed its power upon those whom he was seeking to bless and to save. Yet he did not fail nor become discouraged. He was always patient and cheerful, and the afflicted hailed him as a messenger of life and peace. He saw the needs of men and women, children and youth, and to all he gave the invitation, Come unto me. As he passed through the towns and cities, he was like a vital current, diffusing life and joy. And that concludes our devotional reading for today, November 1st, 2023. May God bless you.